Abe is right. The internet is a scary place. There are people who want to, out there who want to spy on you, who want to steal from you, who want to sell you things that you never know you needed. But scariest of all, ladies and gentlemen, there are people out there, can we cue the scary music, please? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> who will want to persuade you. Now, I know that's not new. Ever since the first caveman, Og, wanted something from the second caveman, Cram, persuasion rated only second behind violence in the rules of acquisition. But the internet has changed the dynamic of that process. Do a quick Google search. You will find 382 million results for internet strategies. 835 million results for internet communication. 855 million results for internet marketing. So two billion websites and God knows how many TED Talks want to tell you how to get people to do what you want them to do. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why I am here. Because if you Google internet security, all you get are websites that tell you how to protect your computer and none about how to protect your mind. You know how companies will hire hackers and thieves to protect them from hackers and thieves? I am that guy. I have spent 40 years practicing the art of persuasion as a contact sport. I have taught from Vladivostok to Tbilisi to Pine Ridge to Rapid City to Artesia, New Mexico. And what I want to talk to you about today are three ways that the internet has fundamentally changed discourse in our society and what you can do to protect yourself from that. The first major impact is civility. We seem to understand that ignorance breeds intolerance. Or at least we seem to understand that when we're talking about racism, sexism, religious differences. But I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that it is every bit as important in politics and in political discourse. I'm seeing blank faces. All right, walk with me. I want you to do something for me, each of you. I want you to turn to the person next to you, and I want you to say, look them in the eyes, and say with all the sincerity you can muster, those people are idiots. Come on, I mean it. Okay. Now, same person, same degree of sincerity. Meet their eyes, and I want you to say, you are an idiot. <laughs> you won't do it, will you? Why won't you do it? You won't do it because civility is bred when we lack distance. It is hardest to criticize, it is hardest to be cruel to somebody that is right next to us. Now I know this isn't new. In 1880, Thomas Nast drew a cartoon showing the New York City Council as vultures feeding on the body of a voter. In 2012, a blog did exactly the same thing, Imperial Wardrobe, with the 1% and the 99%. So this isn't new, but the reach is new. The right meme, the right hashtag, can propel you to millions of people in days, if not hours. And so you have a power, even at a distance, that you never had before, ladies and gentlemen. And there's one other aspect to this. There's a particular problem and a particular type of distance that the internet has created, which is anonymity. In this day and age, there are two kinds of anonymity, full and partial. Partial anonymity is not new. Benjamin Franklin, some people called him the first American, not only wrote under the pseudonym Poor Richard, but several others. Anthony Afterwit, Silence Duguid, Polly Baker, others that I won't even mention. You could make the argument, I suppose, that because he was writing anonymously, that Ben Franklin was our first troll. But was he really? Think back to that day and time. There were 28,000 people in Philadelphia in 1776. Do we really think that the political class 
people reading those papers didn't know who was writing them no matter what name was signed at the bottom. When I go to Dakota War College or Dakota Free Press and I read there and there are people using pseudonyms, I know who most of them are. There are 850,000 people in the state of South Dakota. So all it really conveys is a sense of plausible deniability, not a sense of true anonymity. That's what the internet has brought. The internet has brought us true anonymity, ladies and gentlemen. It has brought us to the point that any sixth grader can set up a new identity with a new email address in five minutes. Most of us in this room could probably do it in less than half an hour. <laughs> From that platform, if you go to any unmoderated site, newspaper, magazine, blog, and it, that has a comment section, you can be completely anonymous. And you can be completely anonymous and have only very slightly less reach than the original author of that post had. Now I am very leery, both as a debate coach and a trial lawyer, of things that sound horribly plausible and end up being just plain old horribly wrong. For those of you over the age of 50, I will use the phrase, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. But the link between vitriol and anonymity is absolutely true. The Eberly Center did a study that showed that even students in larger classes, because they feel a greater sense of anonymity, are less civil to each other. And Professor Arthur Santana of the Jack Valenti School of Communication actually did a, an empirical study in which he found that online comments were 52% negative when posted anonymously, but only 28% negative when posted with a pseudonym or a name. So the link is very clear and it's very real. The second mechanism that the internet has brought us that changes our mechanism of discourse is the straw man. The straw man is a rhetorical device whereby you create a weakened caricature of the argument that your opponent is presenting and then oddly enough you're able to pick it apart fairly easily. My friend Warren Meyer from Coyote Blog describes it as follows. I don't need to listen to the Democrats. I learned everything I need to know about them from Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> I stumbled across two different examples of this as I prepared to speak to you today. One came from Politicus, a self-described magazine of real liberal politics. And in an article about the Republican contenders for the presidency, they led the article with the description that an astonishing 57% of Republican voters would dismantle the Constitution and establish Christianity as the official religion. They accompany that claim with this picture and a link to a public policy poll. If you click that link though, a fairly small number of voters were asked the following question. Do you support or oppose having Christianity as the national religion of the United States? It's not quite the same thing, is it? I understand there's a link to be made in an argument that any national religion would be a bad thing and it would dismantle the Constitution, but it seems particularly unsavory to leave that implicit when you pose the question but make it front and center when you report the results. So I guess we can't trust the liberals, right? Well, not so fast. Because that very same day, a friend of mine posted on Facebook something from Right Wing News. I'm guessing that these people do not hang out with the folks over at Politicus. And they were writing about American Islam. And they reported 58% of American Muslims would declare free speech on illegal. And they accompany that with this picture and a link to a poll. When you go to that poll, what these relatively small number of people were asked was, do you believe that criticism of Islam and Muhammad should be permitted under the First Amendment? Again, there's a link and an argument to be made, but we'd rather set up the straw man than actually deal with the argument. So if mischaracterizing your opponent's position is a bad idea, what about ignoring it entirely? That's what we refer to as the echo chamber. It's the place where all you hear all day long are your own ideas mirrored back to you. And like civility and like the straw man, it is not new. Francis Bacon wrote about it. He described it as confirmation bias. And he said, the human understanding 
when it is once adopted an opinion, draws all things else to support and agree with it. It is the reason that psychologists tell you that we have what are sometimes called stubborn misconceptions, UFOs, ESP. But more importantly, and from my point of view, it is the reason that most trial lawyers believe that an opening statement is more important than a closing argument in the conduct of a trial. Because if I give you the framework, you'll put the facts where they need to be. So how has the internet changed that? Well, in this instance, I believe that it has changed it in a way that is, or was initially, really just a collateral consequence. Put yourself in the shoes of the moderately well-educated 1950s voter. You had three sources of information. You had three television stations, one, maybe two newspapers in the larger cities, and radio probably for fast-breaking news. What all of those things had in common is that they were run by professionals. They were edited, they were corporate, and they were centrist. Your decision of which newscast to watch was probably driven more by personality than ideology. Well, honey, do you want to watch Uncle Walter or should we go with Huntley and Brinkley? In the 80s and 90s, with the advent of talk radio, things began to diversify. Less centrist, but still very much run by professionals. Still very much driven by a profit motive. And then, we get the internet. Truly democratic. It's great, right? Unbelievably fragmented. And absolutely too large for any one of you, or any one at all, to wrap their head around. And the problem is that as a consequence of that, we started going with Francis Bacon's confirmation bias and choosing. So what does it mean? What it means is you never again have to talk to anybody online who disagrees with you. You don't have to see them. You don't have to hear them. You don't have to believe them. You don't even have to set up a straw man that will mischaracterize their arguments. You can retreat into your little cocoon of like-minded people and never come out. And it's become more than just an accident. It's become dogma. Kevin Drum writes for a magazine called Mother Jones, liberal political magazine. And he actually wrote one day about a, an economist from George Mason University who thought that the Clinton era welfare programs had decreased the incentive of people who were on welfare to get out and get jobs. Not exactly something Mother Jones is usually going to be espousing. Not only did Drum quote him, he linked to the article, and he said it was an idea worth exploring. A week later, a fellow by the name of Max Sawicki, filling in for Drum at Mother Jones, told Drum that linking to the article had been your first mistake, brother Drum. Upbraided him for even allowing dissent onto the magazine and told him that he should stick himself to the following go-to list of people on the plight of the poor, which included, oddly enough, this is my shocked face, Max Sawicki and a whole bunch of people who agree with him. And the problem is that the internet makes it incredibly easy to do exactly what Mr. Sawicki wants. From content on Reddit, where you can customize it, channels on YouTube, and even Google, which knows your history, or even if you're anonymous, knows where you are, knows what browser you're using, better not be Internet Explorer, and knows what kind of a computer you're using. So if even Google is going to abandon its role and feed into your prejudices, who's going to save you? That's where there's hope, because there is always the penguin. Okay, not really the penguin, the debater. If you want to get out of this, you have to think like a debater. We have decided, by the way, the reason we refer to it as the penguin is because penguins and debaters are alike in three very important ways. They are always overdressed. They are frequently ridiculed. But they are surprisingly graceful in the correct environment. <laughs> and if you're going to think like a debater, there are three things that I want to bring home to you. You have to make people sign their work. Debaters demand sources. We don't care what you think. We don't care what your opinion is. We want to know what your source is for that. I understand the people that would wish to be anonymous. I understand that there are people who would like to express their opinion and preserve their privacy. But I submit to you that accountability is always preferable to anonymity. 
Secondly, you have to go to the source. Look for links, click the links, never let one side tell you what the other side is doing. And lastly, and perhaps more important, you have to know your enemy. Debaters are uniquely suited to this in a way that the internet absolutely is not. But you have to think like a debater if you're going to preserve yourself. Because when you are a debater, you have to write both sides. You don't know until you walk in a room and flip a coin which side you're going to be presenting. So you have to be equally conversant, not with some straw man, but with the real argument to be presented on the opposite side. You are never fully capable as a debater or as a citizen to present the best argument for yourself until you are also capable of presenting the best argument on the other side. And that it is why it is with great glee that I tell you, if you want to survive this age, if you want a more intelligent, rational, civil discourse, be the penguin.